tēnā koutu katoa, te hei wa mauri ora ki te whaiau ki te amarana, taku taku te pō, taku taku te ao, taku taku te pō, taku taku te ao, he ahara taku moko, ko te ipurangi taku moko, he ahara taku moko, ko te tifana taku moko, he ahara taku moko, ko te tiki taku moko, he ahara taku moko, ko te refa taku moko, E hara taku moko ko te nguna taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te ngu taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te puitaringa taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te wahapapa taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te pierere taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te ngu te rerehupe taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te koropapa taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te tukuwero taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te ngutu purua taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te pūkaue taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te pūkaki taku moko. E hara taku moko ko te mataora taku moko. Te moko nō uetonga nō mataora nō niwareka. E hara taku moko, he moko nō te maunga titohea. Hara mai te ao i tēnei rā. Tēnei ka tuku atu, e ne āhuatanga, uhi, wero, haramai te toki, haumie, huie, tai ki e. E ngā mana e ngā reo, e ngā tapu, e ngā kārangatanga maha o te motu tēnā koto. Tēnei rā, ka mihi atu ki te rangi, ka mihi atu ki a puanga nui, ka mihi atu ki a matariki. Ko mahuta ki te pai. I tēnei rā, ka mihi atu ki ngā mate huhua o te wā, ko whetūrangi tia i roto i te whakaaro o puanga nui o matariki, i roto i te wāhanga o tangaroa. Nō reire e ngā mate huhua o te wā, heire koutou, heire koutou, heire koutou. Heire koutou ki te kāinga tuturu mo te tangata Hawaiki nui, Hawaiki waroa, Hawai ki pama mau te hono i wairua, hawai ki whaka mutu ki te whai au, ki te au maro. A kā ti te wahanga ki a rātau. Tēnei rā i roto o tēnei whenua o tāma ki makaurau, o roto te tau u ngā oho te uringutu, ki te mihi atu ki taku kai kōrero i te rangine. Nō reira ka mihi atu ki a koutou e ngā kai matakitaki, e ngā kai whakarongo. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora hui hui mai anō rātātu katoa. It's my pleasure today to be in Orake, and despite the wet weather in Tatai Tokero over the last couple of days, blue skies and sunshine here in Tāmaki Makaurau, Tāmaki Herehere Waka, Tāmaki kāinga ika me ngā whewa katoa. My guest today is Graham Tipene, and we're going to be talking about moko in a few moments, so we'll cross to Graham. But I'd like to just introduce the kaupapa for today on behalf of Toi Ngāpuhi. Toi Ngāpuhi, Toi Ngāpuhi nui tonu, Toi Tai Tokera. The idea of Toi Ngāpuhi is to unify creatives and expression throughout the whole of Te Tai Tokerau and Ngā Puhi Nui Tonu. To understand that uh, our role as creatives is to express ourselves and to express uh, our extended families, our hapu, our marae and our iwi as we come together in unity across Te Tai Tokerau. Again, we're crossing to uh, one of the creatives uh, a son of Te Tai Tokero, and um, uh, talking about uh, the interesting aspects uh, of Tāmoko, both uh, from the idea of um, creating the marks of moko and also um, the aspects of wearing the marks. Uh, I'd like to now cross to, to Graham, and uh, as we begin our quarter of today, uh, I'd like to also just acknowledge the, the kai kōrero that we've had already. Uh, te warahi he uh, talking about whakairo 
and Phil Wihongi last week talking about um, the elements of urban design and design. Uh, uh, um, I'm really pleased to be in your home today in Orake and um, uh, I'd like you to just speak a little bit about your um, the beginnings for you mm. in um, wanting to be a part of uh, this growing interest in Moko. Where did things start for you? Um, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> I lived in Mount Albert at the time as a, as a kid. Um, my mum and dad left Orake after the wedding and we lived in Mount Albert and uh, my mum became the caretaker at Gladstone Primary School in the early 80s and uh, I was a young fella then and my task was to open the junior block and that would take she gave me 15 minutes it would take about three or four which gave me about 10 minutes of uh, muck around time and in that time you know in the junior block and I would draw and I remember one particular morning I drew a matora without actually understanding what I was doing I just had seen it somewhere I thought oh, I'm going to so I drew one and then it was that day I realized, hmm, I like this. I think I want to, this is something I like and I'm going to continue. And I, and I continue drawing more and more and more uh, to the point where I was pulled out of sport and mum put me into art classes on weekends. And so I was, um, mum saw that in me and, and made sure she, she nurtured that within me and pulled me out of the under nines Metro soccer <laughs> in Mount Albert. And um, so that was, that was, that's, that's where the journey started. And in tipu mai te ra kākono mai i oairaka. Um, when I was growing up there, through, right through high school, it was early 90s as well when the um, Once the Warriors came in. And uh, to see our mataora all over the big screen was, uh, there was a coup man. <laughs> it was game over after that, and I um, met up with a few people who had something to do with those designs and um, started following them during my school years. And then uh, seventh form came and went, and I had enrolled at Auckland uh, University of Technology, AUT at the time, to study Māori art because I knew I wanted to do Tāmoko um, eventually. But that's where it started. That's where it started, and that's where it was nurtured by mum. Um, by not telling me stop drawing on everything. <laughs> um, and like, because we live on Cooper Street now, but we lived across the river camp. We moved back to Orake in the uh, mid uh, late 80s. And um, I had drawn over everything by the time we had moved out. And I went to visit the uncle who now lives in our house. And he told the uh, workers, don't, don't send anything off, leave it there. So if you go to 130 Cooper Street, the banister still has my um, <laughs> first attempts of carving. Uh, up the banister in the, in the state house that I grew up in. Um, and so that's all still there. But I was just thankful my mum didn't, didn't stop me from doing that stuff. She sort of, so far as we went up at the top of Cooper Street was a uh, printing press who made books. And, and we walked in there one day and she says, have you got any paper you're going to throw away? And they said, follow me. And there was a room, big room, about the size mm -hmm. of this lounge. And it was just boxes and boxes of paper they couldn't use. 
and he said, help yourself. And we put as much as we could in the boot of that car. And, awesome. uh, and then that's, so yeah, so mum saved a few pieces of furniture that way. <laughs> and, uh, and so we just had paper and I was allowed to draw whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, however I wanted, which I think is a key to keeping that seed growing. Um, it was just letting me be a tattoo. Um, Similar to um, Te Warahi, Hitaraka, a few mm. weeks ago, was saying that um, that's how he began. So when you were starting, you were supported by your family and mm -hmm. were given resources and nurtured your creativity. Mm. What happened to um, get you involved seriously with Māori design and, uh, and artistry? Um, the studying really helped. It really gave me a, a, at AUT. At AUT, yeah, yeah. Um, and we went to the north, uh, out to Mangukahia, to visit um, Marae State, went to Whangarei to visit um, other carvers and artists. And I think it was it was then that I realised, oh, this is more than just um, something I like mm -hmm. or something I, I like doing. Mm -hmm. That there's a deeper something there. Mm. that I needed to tap into. Um, and so I just made it really clear in my teen years that I, I, this is something I wanted. Um, through Kapahaka as well, um, I remember fifth, sixth form, you know, a vivid was thrown at me. It says, you need to do the front line, I'll do the back line. And I was like, yes. And then, you know, the cousins and your friends that, that willingly laid down so you could draw on them. Um, that, that helped the seed grow. Kapahaka, definitely. Um, and then, yeah, during school as well. You know, we, I didn't get all my classes because my class was sitting with my mates in the cafeteria yeah. drawing them. Yeah. Um, and I, that's just me sharpening my tools. Yeah. Um, so at that time, did you ever think that you would have Matauda on your own face? Never. 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 It was a, a, a change of mindset that didn't happen until five years ago right. but at that time I knew I liked it mm -hmm. and I knew that um, maybe one day mm -hmm. you know it was always just a maybe one day mm -hmm. um, and then and then it, yeah, then it happened last year but at that time it was still trying to release myself from the shackles of colonized thinking mm -hmm. um, yeah as you know as a teenager even after study um, it was more about creating artworks, right. you know, creating creating pieces that I could give to to people. Or um, yeah, we'll come back to your your face. Yeah, 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 in a, in yeah, a little yeah. while. But yeah. were there any mentors that you remember that helped you to just tip over the edge and and begin to explore the depths, perhaps, of um, of Maori? Um, artistry and yep. creativity. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I've got to give it up to all my uncles in Orake um, who always said, you know, you, you're going to do these moko for the team. Um, and they were always pushing. Yeah, yeah, no, he's our man. That's our guy there. Um, which, I, I, to me, it felt like I was part of mm -hmm. uh, 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 something that I was not prepared for mm -hmm. uh, or didn't quite understand that they were claiming me as their person to, mm -hmm. to, to, to put these markings on them with, you know, and that was just for, for with a vivid or a Sharpie. Um, but there was my uncles, definitely. Um, and uh, Taiyaha at the time, he was always um, at school. He was my teacher. And whenever he needed t-shirts for his touch team, um, he would say, oh, here's the name. Can you put some nice designs? And that was another way of crafting, uh, you know, sharpening our chisels, sharpening the mind for future. Um, so uncles, um, cousins, um, and then uh, hanging out with, uh, well, finding people um, that I wanted to, to, to uh, search out. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was um, documentaries on TV, um, you know, you had like the likes of Mark Kopua, uh, Derek Lardelli, the Rangi Skippers, and uh, I remember 98 Matatini uh, uh, Aotearoa Māori Performing Arts at the time in Wellington, walking past uh, Rangi Kippa, who had set up a stall to do moko, and just seeing that and being that close, because mm -hmm. Orake didn't have it, mm -hmm. we didn't have it, and so just being able to say, fire out there, right there, it's right there, it's, I can reach out and touch it. Um, 
and then actively finding their emails and emailing them. And I remember Mark emailed Mark and he said, keep drawing and ring this guy. And it was Tudu Makina. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Tudu Makina a few years later and uh, at, a, at, a, at a totally different kaupapa. And I said to him, oh, I think, uh, yeah, and we, we spoke and he just said, keep drawing, just keep drawing. So, um, yeah, those, those two are kind of those, I, you know, I call them Jedi because that's how I think of them, that they are masters of their craft. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, those, those ones, those ones, definitely. And so when you began to um, actually do moko yourself, mm -hmm. what, was, um, what was some of the challenges? What were some of the things that you had to overcome for yourself to go and to actually marking people with uh, moko? Um, I think the biggest challenge was understanding that it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. and you have to take the hard route. Mm -hmm. um, because I was, you know, still in school, stealing the Indian ink from the art department and then going to the Kazi's house and doing Nike ticks and, with a needle, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, keep still cousin that type of thing for, you know, for ages, my brother, a few of the cousins. Um, but the transition happened when cuts, Arikate to Mahi left uh, Te Puya. When he left the uh, carving school there, he came home and says, we need to do this properly. Mm -hmm. No more, uh, no more half pipe. If we're going to do this mahi, we do it to the best standard we can mm -hmm. and um, train each other up keep each other in check. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, um, that's when we started. This is about the mid 2000s when, when, when he said, let's, you, you and a couple of others. And so that's where we started, um, you know, it's when I figured out what isopropyl alcohol was, <laughs> clean everything down and just spray it at arm's length and try and not be in the room as it settles because it's not good for your tino, yeah, you know, yeah. but it'll kill heaps of germs. Yeah. So all of that stuff, uh, I think that was the hardest part, realising that this isn't just what I know now right. into the mahi. It's what I know now, what I'm about to learn now, but also what I can remember the teachings from hanging out with my with my, my mother. And she always hung out with Koumatu uh, Kuya um, and, and just trying to remember all of those teachings as well. Um, so so yeah. I'm going to pull you back yeah. to the Nike tip. Yep. Uh, in your estimation and your perspective now, looking back, what's the difference between the Nike tick and what you call moko? What's the difference between tattoo and moko? Is there a difference, or what's what's your your take on on that perspective? Um, moko wake, the process. Mm -hmm. The process to me will dictate, you know, just how, yeah, will dictate if it's moko or if it's a tattoo. Mm -hmm. um, and the process is just as important as the product. Mm -hmm. I think tattoo is the other way around, mm -hmm. or if that at all. I think tattoo is product focused, whereas moko is process focused. Let's talk a little bit more about that process. Or... So you go to a tattoo parlor. Mm -hmm. You walk in and you look at the walls and you think, oh, number 23 in red, please. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not much process there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sit down and you get number 23 in red, pick a body part and you're done. Right. For moko, it, the process is a lot longer. There's, a, there's an exchange uh, of, um, it's like a pohiri. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an exchange that happens and only until you're okay with each other, then you hongi. And you go and share kai. Um, an exchange I'll, between the kaita, the person who's doing the yeah, marks. An and exchange, the and, and the exchange is more about um, just making sure we understand each other, mm -hmm. making sure we trust each other, mm -hmm. making sure um, they're ready, mm -hmm. making sure I'm ready. Um, so that process to me is, is one of the most powerful things we can do as practitioners because it means we're not just there um, for the end product. We're there to find out who is this person? Where are they from? Um, you know, what are the whakapapa ties that we may have? Mm. Um, what, are the, what is the story um, that they want to represent? Um, and all of these things um, make what we're about to undergo 
um, so much more important, right. so much more important. And there's, you know, in the last 12, 13 years I've been doing this mahi, I've, the, the kōrero that I've been given mm. from recipients is harikoa etahi and paurirawa etahi. Mm. And so you're, and you can't tell those stories ever again. Mm. They stay up here. Mm. Um, and you can tell people really broadly, oh, this, but you can't be very, you can't be specific because mm. that is the trust they put in you. And so the process to me is um, absolutely um, important and integral to the mana of the mahi we do. What about designs? Yeah, you know, on my, on my website, oh, can you draw me something and send it to me? And that's always a no. Mm. A, because the process, the kanohi ki te kanohi hasn't happened. Right. Um, the kōrero hasn't happened. The sharing of, um, the sharing of whatever hasn't happened. Um, also, so that's, that's the part. The designing part comes down to, especially when they say, oh, can you draw me something and send it to me? No, because your body is not flat. Yeah. <laughs> and so a piece of paper will not, some are flat and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the piece of paper won't won't show the the, the, sh the rounded shoulder yeah. or, or the soft bit of skin in there. Mm -hmm. When it's flat, it's not going to look like that. When it's in that soft bit of skin in there, right. so these things as well. But also the design has to come from. We have to agree on. Okay, is the design I'm doing what I know as design, mm -hmm. or what you what you need? from your area mm. or your rohe or mm. your people. So that's that's the negotiation that also happens. Um, and then we take the design back to the to the the broader um, knowledge of design and then dig down, dig down deeper and when deeper. you say broader knowledge of design, yep. the, the are you talking about the traditional? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you say for instance um, you know, you might draw, oh, this is a koru, this is a puhoro, this is a pitau, this is a mangopare. And they'll be, and, and most of the recipients are like, oh, yeah, that's nice. But hang on, I'm not finished. Mm -hmm. Because it, I, I, it's layers, you mm -hmm. know. Most of everybody will know this layer of this design. They can mm -hmm. look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's this. Very, uh, some will know the next level. Some may know the next level. Very few will know after that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where um, the explanation of the connection of that design back to that person is really important. So they don't walk out saying, oh, you know, that's a, a, a you know, a this or that without actually understanding the deeper corridor that goes with it. And that's just the design. Then you've got the corridor that goes with those designs. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And connecting them back to the recipient, which is, I find it absolutely amazing. In your practice, mm -hmm. uh, when you do moko on people, how do you, uh, one, um, get the story from them? Um, and then how do you explain uh, to them the designs that they carry and will carry for the rest of their lives? How do you, how do you inform them? We It's a lot of... Um, I do a lot of talking and drawing. Mm -hmm talking and drawing because they think it's um chit chat mm -hmm. they think it's me just getting to know you know just chit chatting and making them feel comfortable but i'm actually listening for mm -hmm. audio cues from them mm -hmm. um and pauses and the way their voice explains certain things mm -hmm. will tell me oh this is important right. i need to dig deeper yeah. um <clears throat> yeah so that's how i get them to talk to me and and then I, whatever the, the corridor is, I will represent that in the design. Mm -hmm. And and then I'll go back and I'll, once they're drawn up, I'll say, look, when you were talking, you mentioned this. So I've represented that here. Right. And this design actually means this, but it's used to represent this. Right. You know, that, that um, yeah. So that those levels again, mm -hmm. those level. here's the design. This is what it, represents but this is what it means mm -hmm. and this is how I can expect to you yeah. um, and I always tell them in its simplest form my job is to turn kōrero into design right 
at the end of the day, when you walk out of the studio, your job is then to turn design back into kōrero. Right. If you want to, which I think is another key point, if they want to. That's right. So how do you empower people um, to explain their markings themselves? Uh, uh, often um, there are people that will say, I can see from those marks your mother was left-handed mm -hmm. and your, your father drove a truck for 15 mm -hmm. years. You know, um, that's obviously, mm -hmm. um, there, there is uh, a belief that our marks can be read mm -hmm. by other people. Uh, I'm not sure that that is uh, the case, but what's your perspective on that? How do you um, empower people to tell their own story rather than to have other people interpret them? Yeah, I, it's, it's that, um, I think we have to let them understand that, that the mana remains with them so that they um, have, feel that they have the strength to say, Kao Taiwa, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what I went through to receive it mm -hmm. and then what I got, mm -hmm. which I think is, um, yeah, that, I think that's that's the balance because you'll get a lot of people come in and just, you know, you'll say, oh, da, 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 da. they are things. <laughs> but you have to let them understand that, look, this corridor that we had, this is sacred stuff, man. Mm -hmm. This is um, between us. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can never say it. It's not up to me. Um, I translated it. Now it's up to you. This is your kōrero. And, and then you say, you, have you heard that word tino ranga mm. This is your tino ranga mm. You decide what happens when people ask about this yeah. or, or want to know more about it. Yeah. You have the choice of saying, yes, I will tell you, or no, you can wait. And whether or not they wait a day or forever is up to the wearer. Mm. Um, just because you want to know doesn't mean you're going to know. Right. And I think we have to get that through our heads as well. Mm. Um, you can research all you want, but if you want to know specifics, that could, it's up to that person to tell you. I want to ask you a question. You, you mentioned the word sacred. Yep. Um, so from uh, your perspective as a kaita, mm -hmm. um, how do you reflect that sacredness in your practice? Um, are there um, traditional ways? Um, what what are the processes that you um, have in your practice? I think um, hmm. there's a few things. Eh? Your mannerisms is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, letting your recipient understand that you haven't just stepped into a loud studio with rap music playing, um, you know, um, setting up your environment mm -hmm. as well so that they understand, oh, this is a different level mm -hmm. to what they expected. To me, to me, those little things become, um, people think of those as, can think of those as, as sacredness mm -hmm. or, or being sacred. Um, you know, of course, karakia, um, the way we, you know, set up, break down, all of these things, I think, help become help make it, give it a deeper meaning than, you know, number 23 in red, mm -hmm. um, which gives it a, a, it packs more punch, it packs more punch when, when, when recipients come in and, and, and take on the markings. So in, in respect of sacredness, mm -hmm. is are there um, some significance in the place where Muko takes place uh, and uh, the the steps in the process. What do you do as a practitioner, as a kaita? Um, I've been I've been following the maramataka a lot lately. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's a, not a new thing, but it's there's an app available, so it's really accessible now, and we have no excuse. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's certain days where I will check it, cancel all my appointments. Mm -hmm. Not today. Mm -hmm. Not today. Um, today's no good. And you know, you realise, oh, that's why I woke up not very happy. Or all, all those things. Right. So, so that that um, when I moved back to Orake from Fatififi, I wanted to set up a place to work. 
my idea was to go into a studio in town. Mm -hmm. Are a mai, he said, no, if you can work in Orake somewhere, do that. Mm. And he says, uh, bring the people to the whenua. Tell them the story of our whenua mm -hmm. while they're getting their mahi done. Mm -hmm. Tell them the story of the houses you're living in. Mm -hmm. Tell them the story of all those kids walking past. Mm -hmm. I think those things as well mm -hmm. help give it a special uh, meaning um, and make it some kind of sacred, um, beautiful feeling for the recipient. But just for me as well, you know, being being able to work at home mm -hmm. on my whenua and and letting letting people know. You know. But you go to other people's houses if they request. Is that part of the, the yep. prior negotiation? Of yeah, the that's part of the process. So, so, I mean, like the kauai we did, uh, we went to the whanau's houses. Um, I said, look, I want you to feel happy. Mm. And I want you to feel okay with it. And I feel okay coming to you. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they come here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all okay to play. Um, but yeah, we will go to their houses if, if need be. So we're going to talk a little bit about your um, mataora uh, mm. soon. Um, but uh, you've got some images. So I think we'll just yep. flick through some images. Uh, Francis, if you could uh, put up our presentation. And um, let's spend a couple of minutes. You can flick through and explain the images. So there's a button on the right that you can just push and it'll turn off. <laughs> so we'll Yeah, so this uh, this particular image uh, was we had a year ago. Uh, we had three weekend of moko in Orake at the Marae. Mm. Never happened before. Three massive kaupapa. Mm. Uh, the first one was uh, the Waka fundraiser, Waka, mm -hmm. waka Hurua fundraiser. Mm -hmm. um, then the second week was Mamatora. The third week was the Ngāti Whātua. Tāmoko Wānanga. Right. But this particular piece is a niece of mine, my brother's daughter. And uh, she came in wanting a piece um, down her tuara. And uh, lucky our marae has got Wi-Fi because her mum was on the, on the um, FaceTime being able to be with us while we did that piece. But this is my niece. and um, My niece is a special girl. She's got um, some of those gifts that we write about in stories. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that she was safe and we did it in her whare. Nice. Um, yeah, but that's, that's, she's the eldest mokopunda. Well, she's, no, she's not. No, no, she's not. No, she's not. <laughs> so that is probably um, a, a, an easier starting point for you when you, you have uh, extended family that you, you work with. Yeah, and it helps. Know their stories. Yeah, yeah, we know their stories, mm. especially when it's your niece or your nephew. You know, right. you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I know you. Yeah. Not only do I know you in a family way, but I, I, I know I know you. I know what you've been up to. Yeah, I know why you come into my house. Yeah, I know why I find you. You know, all my nieces and nephews. I understand why you're here. I get it. And so there, yeah, this beautiful girl, she's 21 this year. <laughs> nice. So that's her. Oh, I'll just try and link through, sorry. Yeah. So that's her. Uh, yeah, green one, yeah. Here we go. Good. Um, so being in Orake, um, we host a lot of people from around the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, last year we had a group of Anishinaabe mm. came into the country. Great Turtle Island. Yep, from Turtle Island. And um, I met them, I showed them around Orake, and then I said, look, this weekend we've got our mokowana. Some of them had already got pieces from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Some of them decided to wait. But this particular girl, um, she came back, got a piece, and she stayed with the whanau. She just stayed mm. in our marae, which is why I put her up there, because she mm. chose to her process um, wasn't come in, get her mahi, and then leave. Right. It was come and in, get introduced to the iwi, mm. um, take on her piece, stay with us an entire night, eat with us, break bread with us, uh, you know. Relationships. That's relationships. What that's what, yeah. yeah. And so she understood that. Um, so I gave her, gave her her piece. 
Um, and then the next day, so she, she stayed with us the Friday night, got a piece on Saturday, stayed again Saturday night, and flew out on Sunday mm -hmm. uh, back to Turtle Island. Um, but while she was in Orake, I was trying to find her a husband. <laughs> But oh well, not yet. The the first part of the marriage certificate is yeah, yeah. already signed in signed. that language. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting. I can hear um, questions that uh, people who are, are not Maori can can wear uh, Maori designs. What's your what's your perspective about that? Um, is it exclusive for you? Obviously not. No, nah, I absolutely am okay with it, especially if they're indigenous, mm -hmm. especially if they have an understanding which is the process part right and she understood the process right. she didn't just come in and say oh you know number 23 and read she understood the process she understood how important it was to connect with the people more than just um showing them around the model sure um so that and that's why you know some pieces absolutely not a problem yeah and i'm okay with kind that. of on the first couple of steps with our indigenousness um, and then we can uh, introduce through the relationship and the trust that's built, I suppose you're saying. Um, the, the trust that's built allows the next steps to um, to happen a little easier. Yeah, yeah. Plus this marking will forever be um, her connection back to us. A memory, yeah. yeah. And, and anybody that sees her and sees this piece will know, oh, she spent time with the Māori. She spent actual time with Māori. Right. And then she can explain further. Oh, yeah, there was this crazy guy in Orake that I met who did my shoulder. Um, mm. But yeah, yeah I think. Long hair. Well, yeah, I had really long hair at the time. <laughs> um, but I, you know, and I think that is also important because these markings are recognizable globally. Um, my time in Canada, I seen a girl walking in the street and I went, You've been to Grayland? Mm -hmm. I said, I know exactly which studio you've been into, and I know exactly which artist did your work. Right. And that's what this, that's the power of these markings. Right. Um, and I, you know, and, and and for us, that's those relationships and um, it freaks other people out. You know, they think we're magicians. Yeah. Like, no, no, it's like, it's like reading a book. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Um, so this one I put up uh, just just to talk about uh, dual cultures mm -hmm. um, receiving a piece. Um, this girl is Nui in Maui. Um, she wanted a, 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 a something to represent her Nui and so. And this is what we came up with. She she was absolutely okay with it. This is your process that you. Yeah, this is the process. And I said to her, "Look, I'm not Nui. It would be better if I did the Maori stuff." And you went and got a new Ian to do it. She goes, No, I know you. I've known you since you were 12. Wow. And I want you to do the I want you to do my work. Awesome. And so I was because of our, our historic relationship and she's, you know, one of my best mates. Um, I said, okay, but I really want you to know that I would I'm I would never do another culture's designs. Um uh, if I did do them, they un unwittingly, unknowingly do them because they were similar to ours. Right. Um, Is that a honu? That's yeah. a honu, yeah. 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 So I did her honu. I said, yeah, we have honu. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, and then the left hand side there is uh, her, her new mm. And then the manai on the right hand side. So yeah, she wanted her, her two sides represented. And whereabouts did you do that piece? We did that where she lives. Right. In her family home? In her family home in Whangarei. Wow. In her family home in Whangarei. Um, With her family present? Yeah, so her husband was there. Actually, no, I think that's her husband. And she's got the same one. I see. She's got the same one, yeah, right. yeah. Um, they were at the same time? About two years apart. All right. About two years apart. Yeah, but they got the same one for the same reason, for the same reason. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you get a lot of people. We get a lot of questions on the website. Oh, can you do a Samoan? And mm -hmm. I was like, nope, no, no, no. You should go and see. And then I'll direct them to um, Maori Samoan Mukwa. Because mm -hmm. then I know they're going to be safe with that person right. because that person understands the Maori design world and the Samoan design world. Right. So yeah, that that's what that's what that one is. Um, I used to teach at uh, St Peter's. College in Auckland here, mm -hmm. 
not Hato Petera, uh, mm -hmm. St. Peter's mm -hmm. in uh, Newmarket there. And this is one of our boys, real cool kid. Um, and he came and got his whole sleeve done in one day. Because wow. he's, he's either really tough or really silly. <laughs> um, but he came back and got his shoulder done because they had a, a whānau thing that happened. And I said, yep, come on. But um, so, yeah, this is a young boy. And I felt privileged to be asked because it, it was, um, I don't know, it, it felt to me like so I'd watched him grow up since third form, you know, since mm. 13 years old seven form and it just it felt like you know he 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 wanted to be really connected mm -hmm. to to the teachings i was giving them and, and to us as the family here right so he would come back and get his chest done but we did his shoulder at waka fest a few years ago mm. and then oh we did his arm oh, sorry especially a few years ago then his shoulder about a year and a half, year and a half ago. he's now one of the uh, j geeks mm. You know, really? Yeah. Some wow, of the cool. J gigs, you should see him throw a stick around. Amazing. Wow, awesome. Oh, you're really talented. Boy. So you you mentioned pain. Yeah. How as a practitioner, as a kaita, how do you help obviously it all hurts. We we know this. Yeah. Yeah. How how do you support people when they're taking their marks? Because you know, you must have people that have never had the you know experience of moko before. How do you help them? Yeah. Um I, I I I just tell them um, you have to make them understand that it's all part of it. Right. That actually it's important you have it. Don't avoid it. Don't avoid it. Yeah. At all costs, do not avoid it. Yeah. Be be one with it. Be okay with it. Once you're okay with it, then you understand the difference between I uh, I can't mm. and I won't. Right which I think is a really important thing yeah. to think about when we're doing this mahi. I can't and I won't. It's really important. And so gentle talking, gentle persuasion, it's going to hurt being real with them. Um, and you'll always get the, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. Mm. You know, uh, that's what I want. Mm. Um, uh, only once, oh, no, a few times I've had to stop. Mm -hmm. Um but that's purely because they weren't ready here. Right. Um, once you're ready here, I mean, once you're ready here and here, and you understand in that, your heart and your mind, in your heart and your mind that I'm here for a reason, <clears throat> and pain is part of that reason. Right. Then, then they will understand the true meaning of of receiving these markings, because the pain puts you into a state of contemplation. Right. And while you're contemplating, while you're in the pain. Yeah. <laughs> You're also thinking about those other reasons why you're in there. Yeah. I'm getting this for my kuya or my reasons. koro yeah. or my baby. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? And then you, you understand that actually this pain is now going to be, as soon as it stops, I'm going to be okay. Elevates the memory. Elevates the memory. Mm. And it's ingrained not only in your memory, but also in your heart yeah. forever. Right. So, yeah. Also, that, those watching, I suppose. The people yeah. watching uh, that love you yeah. uh, are wanting to help you to um, work through it. Hey, let's just talk about this before you flick off it. Yep. Uh, so there's red in there. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that That's not a traditional colour I'm picking. No. So what, what what's your perspective on um, the use of colour? Yeah. So, um, you know, colour is a new thing for Tamako. There mm. are some amazing artists out there that, that their colour work is stunning. Ani Karo is one of them. Um, oh, uh, Kingi Pichiroi, mm. you know, the, the likes of these people, the way Turumakina, the way they put color on is amazing. Now, the re reason I chose the colors I choose is because I was part of the Whare Tutaua mm -hmm. or Oka. Mm -hmm. And um, in our teachings there, we have to go through the different colors for Karaki. Mm. <clears throat> and red for our for our for our teachings was a um uh how do i say it? A, like a noble color mm. um and so whenever i use it i tell people this is the reason we're going to use this color and then the way they wear it and the way they hold themselves 
um, becomes, it changes them a little right. bit. It's not just an aesthetic. <clears throat> yeah, it's not me, yeah, check out my reading. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, far out, okay. Because you've stepped up to take the plane, you're going to step up to where the, to where the ink as well. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see it. So, yeah, so that's where, where my colour work comes from. It's from our karakia. Cool. Now, all of those things are informing um, your your practice and your, what you produced as mm. a, as a kaita. You got any more images? Just uh, need a bit reconnected. Yeah, there we go. Kapai. Hmm. So this is one year and one week ago. Ah, when you received your mother. Yeah, yeah. So I came home for a hot shower, and um, Anikaro, Tyler Jade, and a couple of other muku artists had followed me up here. Um, because they, they were doing their own whakamo. And so I gave them my house. And I said, you can have my house. I'm going back to the whare. But I, I snapped this photo. I said, Ani, let's get a quick photo. Nice. And this is within maybe four hours. Had a hot shower, came downstairs, pulled her aside, come in, let's have a photo. And we took this photo. Um, just to, yeah, for my memory, really. Mm. So I can flip through my phone or my you know Facebook and remember, ah, oh, this was the day. July 13, 2019. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your matora now that we've got this image in, mm -hmm. in uh, Anikaro as well. So what was your motivation for taking the matora and how did you choose Anikaro? So... Um, or did she choose you? Yeah, 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 but both. We, um, after my, my whangai mum passed, 2014. Mm. Um, I had promised her, so she made me promise before she passed about a week out. She says, whenever you get asked to do the pipe wire, you have to say yes. And I was like, what? She says, you have to say yes. Say yes. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it was that moment. I realized, okay, now that mum, mum's gone, I'm going to do something for mum. And then three years later, my family dad passed. Mm. But I'll cut by perfect opportunity. I'm going to wait a year to see if I still am keen to mm. do it. But um, I wanted to do it in Matariki, but my father passed in summer. Mm. Uh, and, I, and, and then I was, um, I had an artist already, hadn't told that artist yet, um, but I knew I'm going to get in touch with this artist. And then I was driving through Whangarei and I realised, no, I know who I should who should do it. And Anikaro was the one. A, because I already know her. Mm. B, because she's a strong northern woman. <laughs> and my mum was exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. So I was, no, I'm going to do this for mum with this woman. Um, because I know her it, for all of those reasons. And I was driving through Whangarei, same day I saw her in Whangarei. Right. Crazy. I'm walking past the tattoo. Not so crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Thanks, Mum. Yeah. And uh, same day, and I had just done some work with a friend of mine in Whangarei, talking about Māori art and design uh, for some of her students. And then I says to my baby, because I took my baby, I take my baby everywhere. She said, go get a greasy chicken in a LMP in town. And we walk past this tattoo parlor, and I look in, and she's there. And I was like, ha, meant to be. And so me and my baby walked in. She looks up, she goes, hey, bro. It's like, yeah, can I talk to you? And then that's when I told her. Yeah. And it was about, it was October. I know it was October. Um, and my, my father had passed a year earlier. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, yeah, when? And I says, Matariki. So we can tuku all the ingwa. Mm. And then I'll receive my mato. Mm. So that gives us eight months. Mm. She goes, Kapoi, see you in eight months. Cool. And then that's how the decision came. Yeah. Right. To use her. To wow. use her. Because yeah, and our whakapapa ties back up to the to the final. So now you've got your matawa. Yeah. And tell me and tell people who are listening what 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 has changed in you 
Mm. Uh, obviously, your face has changed. <laughs> and what has the what is the change that you've seen outwardly in the way people interact with you? Yeah, funny stories ever yeah. since. You know, it's been one year, and and the funniest stories were the first two months. Mm. In fact, the first two days. Um, the day after this photo, I had to take Tino Al Patino to the airport, and it was my first outing. And I'm sweating, like, oh no, Caprice is laughing at me. Tino's got his whole body done from his dome yeah. to his toes. Yeah. In the Tahitian style, yeah. the Mamakisa style. Yeah. So he's used to it. Yeah. But this is my first outing with my with my Matora. Um and I'm looking at everybody, thinking, what are they thinking? Yeah. And it was that day I realized, don't look at anybody. Yeah. So I now, wherever I go, I look over people, right. look at, either at their foreheads or past them. Yeah. And my kids stand behind me and look at everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and I, they always tell me, they say people do this. And follow you. And eyes. follow you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I, so that's one thing I've, I've start, I started to do, was look over people, just so I didn't make eye contact, so I didn't make it weird. Um, and I'm okay with that, it's all good. Um, the other thing that happened was the day after the, air, the airport trip, I had to go to a podiatrist to get my foot checked. And we walk, I walked down to St. Heliers. If anybody knows St. Heliers, mm -hmm. there's not many of these roaming around. <laughs> and I got lost. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in the stairwell trying to find the address. What floor am I looking for? And then this lady comes out of this hallway. She says, can I help you? I says, oh, I'm looking for this address. She says, oh, you're straight through there. She's looking at me, and I'm oh, thank you, thank you very much. I walk in, and I hear a loud gasp. As I open the door, I hear someone go, <gasps> and Dungi me, I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> like looking for what they're gasping at. Yeah. And as I'm standing at reception, there's a mirror behind reception, and I look at myself, and I'm like, oh, All right. it's me. Right. So I grab a paper, I sit down, I says, I'm here to see you. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll call them in. I grab a paper and I hold it up in front of my face like this. And then my mum whispers in my ear, you better put that bloody paper down. Yeah, yeah. And I folded it, put it down. And I just remember crossing my arms and doing this. Till my name got called. Yeah. It's about a 10 minute wait. Yeah. Just waiting and waiting. And that 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 was the first time I had ever thought, no, 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 you're in this for the long haul. You're not in this because it's fashionable. You're not in this because this is the trend right now. This is the long haul. Regardless of what anybody else thinks, you're in this forever. And it was that day. So that, that's another thing, you know, you, you've got to walk with your head up regardless. So that that's, yeah. And, and experiencing the world differently has been pretty cool mm. in the way people interact with you. I think, Francis, if we could go off presentation view now, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk to Graham directly about um, about his mata ora. Thank you. Um, uh, let's keep talking. Tell us a little bit about um, a positive um, mm. direction that stands out for you. Most unexpectedly. Yeah, perhaps. unexpectedly. Most of the experiences have been positive. Mm -hmm. um, the negative ones were just minimal. Wonderful. But most of them, and the funniest one was at, um, up here at Eastridge, mm -hmm. which is, you know, Mission Bay. So there's a lot of non-Māori walking around. And I was at the avocados, and there's this tall, elder Pākehā gentleman standing next to me, and I sort of had my shoulder to him, and I'm checking avocados. And then he says, excuse me, and I looked at him, and he looked straight at me, didn't flinch. And he says, these are the worst avocados I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm like, can he see me? Like, is he? And yeah. I was like, yeah, he, all he sees is a human. Right. And I just felt so good at that time, I was like choice. And so me and him are swapping avocado stories for about five minutes. I'm like, hey, try this one, swapping. So that, I think that was one of the best experiences. And that was an assumption on my part, mm -hmm. not him. Mm -hmm. That was on me. Mm -hmm. To assume that anything bad was going to come out of his mouth, right? And so then I, so that's another experience. But it was, it was so choice. I felt really good at that that moment when he you know, he just started talking to me. 
how about your practice? Has your practice changed since you wear um, moko matau right now? Um, not not much, but what I've what I've gained since is um, more karakia. Mm. People are giving me karakia, mm. which which I absolutely love. Mm. Um, and you use it in your practice. You use them, yeah, using them. So. So when I had, you know, a few karakia, now I've got a whole lot of karakia, purely for moko. Mm. Some have been written a long time ago, mm. and some are quite recent. So, mm. so yeah, that, that's changed. But, you know, in terms of the actual doing the mahi, mm. not much. Still use the same processes. Mm. And, but it's good having that, that kete mm. of, of karakia, being able to use them. So what about... You know, we've, we've seen some of your work um, that you've done on people who are not Māori, not mm, from here. Mm. Um, how about moko mataora and moko kawe? So also, you you said about doing moko kawe for, for women. Yep. Um, would you ever moko someone, someone's face who wasn't Māori? Uh, no. Where is it? I, I, I wouldn't. I believe... Um, the mataora and the kawai should remain ours, mm. purely ours, because we understand the depth of where we, you know, the story of its origin and the depths that they had to go to to receive it, mm. to take it on. Um, yeah, that's me. I, I, I would, yeah. Definitely stay with Māori. Mm. Stay with Māori for those reasons. Because, yeah, it's harder to explain the difference between taking on a, you know, I'm going to get my arm done and get my... When you take on mataora and kauai, the world experiences you differently. Mm. And, and coming out of those generations where it was absolutely a no-go zone, mm. to now we are, it is being recognised more as normal in the mm. world. Um, we, want to, we want it to be normal for us. Mm. So that when we go out into the world, that oh, yeah, they are Māori. Mm. They are purely Māori and that is them. So I think that's, yeah, that, for me, that's how I, I look at it. That's mm. how I look at it. Yeah, I, I, so um, some of the questions that we've received is about, uh, like you've explained, Ani Karo did your yep. mataora, and you've just uh, completed um, my, my yeah, cousin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John's wife, Aroha, and her kawe. So where does the gender um, perspective come for you? Um, is there a line? Um, is, the, is it a matter of negotiation? Where does where does gender um, come into things, particularly for people who are considering um, taking moko? Um, sorry, Aroha, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the gender thing, hmm. Going to hurt your mama. <laughs> yeah, the gender thing. Who? How, how do you mean in terms of gender? So, um, I, I suppose uh, some people might say, "Are you allowed as a man to do the moko kawe or moko te ah. for a woman? Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, a woman um, like Anikaro allowed to do the mata ora? Where does where does that fit with uh, your thinking? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know we just come off a warning about this stuff. Um, and, and the colonized view of men only mm. is now being torn apart, mm -hmm. torn apart completely. And that's also why I wanted a woman. Mm -hmm. So that when we did it in our whare and mm. had all our family standing there, mm. they were like, hey, e wahine te, mm. spilling our cousin's blood. Mm. And he's okay with it. It's because it's, it's okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, totally okay with it. Totally okay with it. Um, because of that, you know, we have uh, kōrero, 
uh, and, and stories. The process. Yeah, yeah. The process was perfect. But also those corridor and stories, um, the evidence is there mm. that it was done right on. Mm. So we're going to be okay with it. So yeah, I think, I think to answer that, how fine. I suppose uh, we're coming to a, a natural conclusion and I, I thank you, Graham, for um, inviting us into your home. Um, what would be your advice for people who are considering moko, either um, designs on their bodies uh, or even young women and men thinking about uh, moko kanohi? Tuhi whatukura, tuhi marekura. What, what's your advice to people considering these things? How would you advise, as a kaita, but also as someone who wears muko, how would you advise people to, to start their, um, their yeah. quest? Yeah, I think uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things for Fano who get asked the question, because some people will go to their whānau first and say, I want to take on Matora, or I want to take on Kauai. The worst thing to say is no, and just leave it at that. Mm. The best thing to say is, let's call it all more. Mm. Because the let's call it all more means they're both researching and they're both finding ways to understand why. Mm. I think that's really important. The absolute no is, is detrimental mm. to the growth of the, the growth of our mahi but also to the growth of the individual person. Um, not yet is way better, mm -hmm. way better, because then they've got an opportunity as an individual and as a whānau mm. to grow in the idea, mm. to grow in the, in the to, to let that question um, permeate within. So yeah, yeah. And also ask the questions, just ask the questions, do your own research, um, find your kōrero, find your reason, and the, the more depth you have in your reason, um, the stronger your base will be for when you finally receive it. Right. And all of those box ticks, you know, and and you can't write down the box ticks, mm. your heart will know this. Right. What about, you know, there's a common question that's asked, which is, I have to be fluent in te reo before yeah. I wear moko on yeah. my, my face or, or wear ta moko in general. Yeah. What's your perspective? Oh, I laugh at that because um, prior to European arrival, mm. we were all fluent. Mm. So you were getting your mata regardless. Mm. Mm. Now that English is our first language, mm. um, there's steps to be taken for us to understand our language mm. more. So get the mata ora, mm. get the kauai, mm. with the understanding that you have a responsibility now to your people and your culture. Mm. And if you uh, are taking on the reo and learning the reo at the same time, payana, mm. payana. And we can't let um, those ideas, those past ideas, those historic ideas that you must be this first, mm. you must be that first mm. to take on this mahi. Because then you, we will never do it. Because, mm. um, I mean, I... I've never been to a Panikire Tanga class, you know, but I wanted to do my mato. Mm -hmm. I've never been to, uh, you know, those high end kura reo, mm -hmm. but I wanted to get my mato. Ora. And I know my journey in the reo is far from over mm -hmm. and will always be a long journey. But um, yeah, um, my advice to them is do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Because the balance of the regrowth of our culture is not building one up over the other the balance, you have to bring them both up together. You can't, and that happened when we went into level two. I stopped, I closed my doors because of the tangihanga restrictions. Mm. Who am I to take, to take on, to, to uplift this moko tikanga if our tangihanga tikanga is taking a beating? Mm. So we have to balance it all out together. Mm. Um, so we've got a harder job because it's visual and experiencing the world with our face done is different. You can speak Māori, and keep your mouth closed, mm -hmm. and no one will know. But once you wear matoora, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. You can't wear a balaclava to the supermarket because mm -hmm. they can probably get arrested. Yeah. So that, that's where I see it. So yeah, go for it. Absolutely go for it. What about age? Um, yeah, there's a common question <laughs> is, you can't wear a muko kauwe or a muko matoora until you're a kaumato or a kuya. Yeah, no, nah, 
as a practitioner, the younger the better. Because? Because the skin is taut. Right. The skin is tighter, it's easier to put ink into. Uh, as you get older, it's harder to put ink into the skin, mm. and we have to stretch further. Right. Um, and at the Queen's, at Te Aotairangi Kahu's 10-year memorial, mm. we did 23 women. Mm. And they're all over 50. Mm. Ah, bar two. Mm. And Tyler Jade got those two. And the rest of us had, um, yeah, everybody over 50. Mm. So they were older. Their skin had seen a few years. Right. And there's a lot of stretching. Um, and it's harder for the practitioner. Right. Younger, in terms of application, mm. way better. But you also have to have the whānau involved completely. Mm. Because a tattoo parlor's conscience is the law. Right. For tamoko, to take on tamoko, the conscience is the whānau. Right. If that recipient messes up, that's on the whānau, mm -hmm. not the law. Mm -hmm. It's on the whānau to keep them in line. Right. So when I had a 14-year-old take on a piece, wasn't on her face, it was on her leg. I said, no, your mum and dad have to be there. Your, ko your koro and your kuya have to be there. Your aunties and uncles have to be there because they are going to keep you in line. Mm. So that, that's where I said. That's you, your practice. Yeah, that's my practice. Mm. And it just keeps the whānau also involved with moko because they can say, I was part of that session. Yeah. Okay, here's, a, here's a, an interesting one. Um, if if um, uh, a man came to you and said that he wanted to wear moko kaui, mm -hmm. moko tehe, mm -hmm. what would be your perspective? Uh, my perspective would... Uh, How would you respond? To yeah, that? I would probably um, send them a, to a few, few books and websites that explain um, why why uh, wahine have this particular design and mm. why men have this particular design. And we know it's happened in the past. Um, personally, I wouldn't do it. Mm. Um, and I would explain why. Mm. Um, but I'd also expect them to research why as well, mm. so that it's not just me telling them, right. so that it's them researching to understand why. So that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning about process. Process. And relationship between you and the person who's requesting the work from you. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Big time. Right. Process process is just as important as product. Kapai. Well, um, Kitty, I think we we come have come to a natural kind of conclusion for today. Mm. And um, I really am um, um, proud of you uh, as a close Fanonga. Um, both in terms of Ngāti Hene and Ngāti Whātua and Ngā Puhi Nui Tonu. Um, I'm very grateful for your um, family opening your house to us today. And um, I'm really grateful for you sharing your perspectives right from uh, those early times um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of um, being nurtured by your extended family. Um, one of the, the aspirations of Toi Ngā Puhi is to begin to help our families, our whānau, to identify where creativity is, is starting. Um, just as Te Warahi, uh, said in his beginnings, he was identified by his village people. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about your village here in, um, in Orake, mm -hmm. uh, also in, in where you are, other places you're connected, like in Patififi and, and also in Ngātihini. Our... Um, uh, authority that comes from our tino rangatiratanga, our confidence, our individuality, which comes from our mana mutuhaki, mm -hmm. um, the role that kaita have in our um, our aspirations. I suppose, in, in conclusion, I'd like to also thank you because uh, this is 2020, uh, a year that we're not likely to forget, not just because <laughs> of uh, COVID 19. Um, but we're only 20 years away from 2040. 1840, Mataura and Moko Kaue um, were present at the signing of the treaty. 100 years later, 1940, not any Mataura. So perhaps in 20 years' time, uh, with advice like you've given to um, people watching today, um, we might be able to expect uh, that Mataura and Moko Kaue and their extended families will be present uh, in Waitangi on the 6th of February to celebrate um, 
our uh, coming of age, perhaps, uh, and our, our pride in standing to toa, to rangatira, to tangata, i rotu i te ao. Nō reira, e koro, tēnā koe, uh, tēnā hoki koutou tō tō ake whaamere, e whakawātea nei tēnei tō, tō koutou nei whare mahana rawātu uh, i tēnei rā. Nō reira, e te iwi, um, uh, ko whakarapo tō tō tātou nei noho i te rangi nei, uh, kia tau anō ngā manaakitanga kia, kia koutou i rotu i o koutou nei kāinga mahana. Uh, Nō reira, ko mutu tēnei kōrero. Te hei uri uri, te hei nako nako. Ka tau hā, ka whakatau ko te rangi e tūmi. Ka tau hā, ka whakatau ko te papa i raro. Ka tau hā, ka whakatau ko te mātuku mai i raro tonu. Ko i a rukuhia manua paura tonu. Ko i a rukuhia manua pauaho. Waka tina ki a tina te mōre i Hawaike e pūpū ana huke e wawau ana huke. Tā rewa tū ki te rangi a wekea eke, eke panuku, Eke tangaroa, hara mai te toki, haui e, hui e, tāi ki e. Tēnā koutou, kia ora, hui hui mai anora tātou katoa. Tēnā koutou.